actually when you go to party, it's, it's uncanny. So if you can imagine this, it's an island, like I said, where the world has passed and the world has left its mark on the, on the faces and bodies of its different peoples. You have everybody there from blonde, blue eyed types, Nordic types, uh, to the Chinese looking ones, to Indian looking, but they're all party islanders. They're all party islanders there. And it's, it's a fascinating kind of capsule of, of what the world has been. Hi, I'm Yvonne Aviambo Awar. I'm a writer from Kenya and, uh, and also a traveler, I guess, and an observer of uh, our human happenings um, that inspire the stories I tell. Uh, you know, my stories always start from landscape and it's not as if I go looking for them. Um, and I think that was a part of my own process involves uh, uh, learning to get out of the way and, and allowing s something to find you. And, and it always happens through landscape. So whether it's uh, the desert landscape of northern Kenya or the ocean that I absolutely adore, or more recently uh, on the train ride from Bergen to Oslo, uh, suddenly the, the overpowering sense of, of the snow and, and, and snow landscapes. And, and it struck me in such a way, almost like an epiphany. I had no, I had, I had no idea that it was so um, diverse. Um, so, and, and so when, when, the, when the feeling of that stays with me, then I know, aha, uh -huh. um, it, it always starts with landscape. It's almost as if the muse sends you, the, the palette is landscape. And then you're kind of thinking, ah, someone or something is going to show up. And then you, then you follow that person, the character, and that becomes the story. This novel is actually my own ode, my own uh, um, uh, praise of, of the ocean. I absolutely love, uh, I truly, truly love. I adore that ocean. Um, I, met the, I, met the, I met the Swahili Sea when I was seven years old and I'd never seen anything more splendid. And it means that my entire life, I, it, it makes me ocean haunted. And I guess because of that, I was always going to write something about the sea that I love so much. Um, but, uh, but then also within the context of our relationship with China, um, I noticed that a lot of mostly, I guess, Western um, conversations are kind of bewildered in terms of what does China have to do with, that, uh, with, with Africa? They're so far away, but actually we are not. We are neighbors if you consider the ocean, if you consider the Western, what they call the Western Ocean, what we call um, our Swahili Sea or Indian Ocean. And we've been neighbors for a long, 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 long time. Um, and it's about the, the ways of looking at the ocean, the biographies um, that are in the ocean and under the oceans as well. And so uh, then there was no way then in terms of, because this is also a book about relationship, and uh, there was no way that uh, the, the ocean would not ha have a prominent role as mediator, as, uh, as midwife, as uh, matchmaker as well. And I was um, interested in the African position, in the East African position, and kind of the intimate histories um, of, of this China uh, reconnection. And at that time, when I started out looking for this story, I was not considering a re it a reconnection, even though the evidence of that had been very uh, present to me when I was, for example, uh, the executive director of the Zanzibar Film Festival. My favorite Chinese restaurant there is owned by a fourth generation Zanzibari of Chinese origin. And so uh, our, our histories, because of the seas that we share, our histories with China are very long and very deep and very, and very actually intimate and profound and intricate as well. And, and the Indian Ocean is unique among all the other oceans in the world because it has its currents were very consistent, very mathematical and very consistent. The, the, the southeasterly and the northeasterly. Um, so there were boats could come into the East African coast and boats could leave the East African coast. And the East African coast in multiple centuries, uh, long before um, Europe was even considering cosmopolitanism, 
uh, this particular ocean, because of the regularity of this current, um, there'd been an intricate connection of, uh, of linked trade and exchange between China and East Africa, but also India, what becomes known as the Middle East or Arabia, Persia. Um, so it's not just China that uh, where you where you find the connections. You'll find uh, you know uh, the Swahili doors are variations of the Gujarat doors. Uh, the the, the, there's a fabric called the Leso, the Kanga, that's very, very distinctive, um, uh, linked to the particular coast. But uh, the cotton was made in, uh, in India, and uh, the designers were in East Africa. The transportation was by, I don't know, Sri Lankan. So there's, there was this intricate uh, um, globalization, global, the, the global connection. And I've and it's the idea of the not just the fluidities, not just of identities, but of you know exchange, belonging, of trade, um, and and a kind of hospitality linked to you know, I, I think at the, at the core of everything was trade, frankly, it was just trade, and the exchange of goods, and and this was this was what this is a kind of it's over it's a, over a thousand year old history. It changes, of course, now when great competitions uh, come in from. Um, say, starting with Portugal, and of course, the, the, the Hadrumat, the, the, uh, or, or not quite all, Yemeni Arabs. There's a sense of wanting to control, wanting to take hold of uh, the, the East African entrepreneurs, because the, this, is, this is kind of the central point through which not just trade, but also uh, knowledge, knowledge is passing through. And, uh, and, unfort and unfortunately, when especially the at first, when the Portuguese first, uh, initially the Portuguese were well behaved, but when the competition for kind of ownership of, of, of territories entered into the game, uh, the Portuguese, the British became real asses. And they, what they wanted, what they actually did was disrupt a delicate balance. Um, I'm not saying everything was perfect, but what I'm saying was that there was a, nobody thought they, nobody, it never entered into any other person, any other culture's mind that they could control and own the seas. So, and, and, and with the entry, especially of, 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 the, of, the, of the British and the, and the Portuguese, um, there was a, an amputation. Uh, those links were completely amputated. Uh, but we, what is even more tragic was that um, uh, people like Admiral Fremantle, uh, when when they went to the archives in a place called Witu, uh, what they what they basically would do is they they bombarded the archives and with the intellect with the with the intelligentsia inside, and and burnt down uh, the the archives and the records. It was very deliberate. It was part of part of the part of the strategy was the burning down of of archives and records, um, so that another history of the sea would be written on top of what had been an, a, a, a thousand year old uh, um, encounter and experience, yes. I think it was the late Pinyavang, and Pinyavang only shows up in my works anyway. He's the one who told me, get the hell out of the way of the story. So I never set out to say, I'm going to write this historical novel, or you know, I'm going to use, the... but history as a palette is very important for my, um, my own art. Uh, my own growth as an artist. It, it shows up. I, I need its energy. Um, I need its uh, absence. I need its darkness. And I, I need its mysteries. And I guess its response to the, um, the East African, the African Yvonne, the, uh, the artist, uh, the, uh, artist uh, the African as artist. Because um, I think it's part of the outrage of the amputations. Um, the, the histories that are written, deliberately written over so that Africa could be portrayed a particular way. And, and then you go and you find the ruins of, of that. And uh, maybe my work is partly also a, an attempt to repair some of those ruins uh, for, for, not, for, my, for my main audiences, the Africans, uh, you know, the, and at least the children to come so that they can have references and remember that some of the stuff that is written in the history books about them is a lie. And, and if they want it, uh, um, they can actually go and find, um, you know, enter into the realms of their own stories. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So the I look for the histories that have fallen into the cracks and uh, bring them out, yes.
And uh, in 2005, um, a young girl then uh, from this island that's, that's you know, it, it lost its glories, uh, but it's, it's a massive island called Pate Island uh, it, it, as part of the Lamu Archipelago. Now, uh, the backstory is that when the great Chinese admiral, uh, Zheng He, was leaving the East African coast on his seventh voyage, uh, returning to China, uh, that was just before China turned its back to the seas. Um, he had he lost a third of his fleet in a terrible, terrible storm. And then it seemed that some of the sailors survived and ended up on Pate Island and decided to stay um, and, and got married. And even though it said they set up settlements, but the settlements already pre-existed. Uh, the settlements that were there um, pre-existed, uh, um, preceded them. So it, it, there's, there's suspicion. I, I've, been, I've been to the island a few times. This is, so it's very possible and very likely that there'd been a long history of, of trade and exchange between China and that is part of the, of, of the world, of the East African coast. So when the sailors settled there, of course, they married and, and uh, you know, just, you know, did what sailors do. <laughs> and uh, so there's a multi, there's a generation that have, A, kept family names, um, like Wei, Famao, Xi, uh, these also Pate Island names. And, and this girl, uh, doctor, she's now a doctor, uh, at that time, Mamaka Sharifu, through DNA testing, um, um, <clears throat> you know, suggested that yes, she had Chinese antecedents, and she went to China on a scholarship um, to ch study Chinese medicine, but also to meet in, in a very moving. I, I talked to her; she just how moving it was also for her, uh, in, in a way to meet other descendants uh, to, uh, uh, of, of from, from that particular voyage. So I was so inspired by that particular story, and this happened in two thousand and five at the 600th year anniversary of China's, uh, of Zheng He's uh, voyages, and used the inspiration of that story to tell the story of a little girl uh, growing up on Pati Island and who ends up going to China, yes. Uh, so in the novel we have Ayana, uh, who is um, the illegitimate daughter of a single mother uh, in an island that's also, you know, it, it's, it's actually it's been one of the, it's one of the most liberal uh, islands, but uh, there are certain values that kind of, set, and even it's very, it's also very uh, matriarchal, woman-centered, but there are certain rules, you know, you, you need to have a husband kind of thing. Uh, but you know, her mother decides to raise her on her own. So, so there's a there's a kind of stigma attached to her, but that doesn't stop her from uh, looking for you know expressing her own longing for her father. And so she appoints a returned uh, uh, boatman, Muhyiddin. She appoints him as her father, against his own kind of he, he resists everything because nothing he's never wanted anything to be attached to him. And uh, and that yeah, and it was fun exploring that uh, uh, rediscovery of, of of love of the affection between father and daughter and quite frankly I think I was partly inspired because uh, by my own father had died at that particular time when I was working on this book and I maybe it's also a tribute uh, it was partly also a tribute to to him my own father. And may I would have put the you know the qualities you know the, the qualities that my own father had. Um, so, but yeah, so for for Muhyiddin, it's the rediscovery of, of vulnerability, uh, and and love makes you very vulnerable, and and makes you weak in an interesting way. And and for Yana, she finds a pillar, um, the kind of pillar that she wanted. So there's that, and then there then there are all these island characters. Uh, and what I love is uh, uh, when, uh, especially when East African readers say, oh, I know this woman. <laughs> I know this woman so well. Yeah. And yes, they're inspired by people I didn't meet and I didn't know. <laughs> especially in Zanzibar. You don't get mad, you get even. <laughs> so I'm reading from the Dragonfly Sea. And I will start with... Uh, 
the, the poem, uh, no, actually, not, not quite the poem, a, a kind of a message, a, a will, a testament that uh, one of the great uh, uh, luminaries of Pate Island, Mwana Kupona Bintim Sham, left for her daughter uh, when she thought she was going to die. Take this amulet, child, and secure it with cord and honor. I will make you a chain of radiant pearl and coral. I will give you a clasp, fine without flaw, to wear on your neck. Wash and perfume yourself and braid your hair. String jasmine and lay it on the counterpane. Adorn yourself in clothes like a bride and wear anklets and bracelets. Sprinkle rose water on yourself. Have rings on your fingers and always henna on the palms of your hand. Mwana Kupona Bintim Sham. The soul is a visitor. Roho Nimgeni. To cross the vast ocean to their south, water chasing dragonflies with forebears in northern India had hitched a ride on a sedate in between seasons morning wind, one of the monsoon's introits the Matlai. One day in 1992, four generations later, under dark purplish blue clouds, this fleeting beings settled on the mangrove fringed southwest coast of a little girl's island. The Matlai conspired with a shimmering full moon to charge the island, its fishermen, prophets, traders, seamen, sea women, healers, shipbuilders, Dreamers, tailors, madmen, teachers, mothers and fathers with a fretfulness that mirrored the slow churning turquoise sea. Dusk stalked the Lamu archipelago's largest and sullenest island, trudging from Siu on the north coast, appending Kizingitini's fishing fleets before swooping southwest to brood over a patted town that was already mouldering in the malaise of unrequited yearnings. Bruised by endless deeds of guile, siege, war, and seduction, like the island that contained it, Pate Town marked melancholic time. A leaden sky poured dull red light over a crowd of petulant ghosts, dormant feuds, forfeited glories, invisible roads, and congealing millennia-old conspiracies. Weaker light leached into ancient crevices, tombs, and ruins, and signaled to a people who were willing to cohabit with tragedy, trusting that time transformed even cataclysms into echoes. Deep inside Pate, a cock crowed, and from the depths of space, a summons, the azan crescendoed. Sea winds tugged at a little girl's lemon green headscarf, revealing dense black curly hair that blew into her eyes. From within her mangrove hideout, the scrawny seven-year-old, wearing an oversized floral dress that she was supposed to grow into, watched dense storm clouds hobble inland. She decided that these were a monster's footsteps, a monster whose strides left streaks of pink light on the sky. Seawater lapped at her knees and her bare feet sank into the black sand as she clutched another scrawny being, a purring, dirty white kitten. She was betting that the storm, her monster, would reach land before a passenger-laden dhow, now muddling its way towards the crocked wharf to the right of her. She held her breath. Homecomers, she called all passengers. Wajio. The child could rely on such homecomers to be jolted like marionettes whenever there was a hint of rain. She giggled in anticipation as the mid-sized dhow, with Bikirude painted in flaking yellow, eased into the creek. Scattered soft raindrops, the thunder-spirited rumbling caused every homecomer to raise his or her eyes skyward and squawk like a hornbill. The watching girl sniggered as she stroked her kitten, pinching its fur in her thrill. It mewled. Shh, she whispered back as she peered through mangrove leaves, the better to study the passengers' drizzle blurred faces. A child looking for and gathering words, images, sounds, moods, colors, conversations, and shapes, which she could store in one of the shelves of her soul to retrieve later and reflect upon. Every day in secret, she went to and stood by the portals of this sea, her sea. She was waiting for someone. The girl now moved the kitten from her right to her left shoulder. Its extra-large blue eyes followed the dance of eight golden dragonflies hovering close by. Thunder. 
The Tao drew parallel to the girl and she fixated on a man in a cream colored suit who was slumped over the vessel's edge. She was about to cackle at his discomfort when a high and hurried voice intruded. Ayana! Her surveillance of the man was interrupted as lightning split the sky. Ayana! It was her mother. Ayana! At first the little girl froze. Then she crouched low, almost kneeling in the water and stroked her kitten. She whispered to it, Hi, Duru, don't mind. She can't see us. <laughs>